tonight, uh, Jay Dyer has come back to discuss uh, perhaps in more detail or more in depth some of the topics we uh, brought up uh, in our discussion a few days ago. So he's kindly decided to spend more of his time with, uh, with me tonight. Uh, Jay, how are you doing tonight? Great. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you. Uh, Jay, of course, runs the uh, website Jay's Analysis, where he it's a very eclectic and uh, interesting website where he anal analyzes movies, pop culture, geopolitics, philosophy, a lot of other topics. So you go to go there to Jay's Analysis uh, dot com and you can read his stuff. And if you should if you should uh, be so uh, inclined, uh, he also has a tab there where you can uh, support some of his work, which I think is uh, is worth people's support. Uh, out there because it's it is excellent analysis jay um uh, last week uh, or at least a few days ago we uh, we talked about uh, the various crises world wars uh, of the last century the cold war and today's uh, war on terror as being sort of a manufactured crises uh part of a strategy of tension concocted by i guess the atlanticists or anglo-american elite to create sort of a hegelian dialectic Mm -hmm. in furtherance of a new world order, uh, for lack of a better term. Could you uh, uh, explain that or just go deeper into that and start off the conversation? And uh, in reference to uh, what was, I'm sorry, what was I was doing? So what was the very first uh, point that you made in reference to what? Oh, uh, basically, basically uh, how the various conflicts, the world wars, both World War One and World War II, uh, the ensuing Cold War that was considered a product of the, of the, of the Second World War, and of course, the war on terror. Had these events are kind of uh, manufactured, uh, sort of uh, concocted, uh, uh, in order to manipulate right. the, you know, the global scene to, I guess, the master the for the bankster cabal or, or cartel to, or monopoly to, uh, f uh, I guess, tighten their grip on on world on the world. Yeah. Well, for me, uh, I didn't learn any of, of that kind of stuff when I was in college, doing undergrad or grad school. That was more of a <clears throat> project that I. I decided to research on my own. So what I did was just, you know, you hear the, the these different books bantered around uh, in different alternative media circles. So I decided to just buy these books and read them. And that's really, I guess, what I've been doing the last 10 years. And what you come to find out um, is that all of it is, for the most part, pretty much spelled out, you know, by official uh, policy papers, by official big, uh, you know, big policy books. And so when you delve into the writings of, uh, say, Dr. Carol Quigley or uh, Zbigniew Nibrzynski, um, or particularly when you, the, a lot of the meat you can find in uh, treatments of espionage, uh, particularly in the Cold War. <clears throat> and even the main line, uh, you know, histories of espionage or uh, spy biographies or those, even those kinds of, of historical works are full of little nuggets that really help you put the puzzle together. So <clears throat> I think it's important for researchers to get a bigger perspective than just reading alternative news or alternative media or this or that conspiracy site, because uh, you really need, uh, you know, the, in other words, the broader your perspective, the broader your grasp, the better off you are for understanding the world. So what I did was when I was working on uh, my grad doing my grad work, we, I had a class that taught advanced research methods. So uh, that was helpful in terms of getting a perspective on how to actually, you know, source things and whatnot. But I think in order to understand the Cold War, it helps to understand um, the long history of uh, what we might call warfare or strategic operations or psychological warfare operations, black operations, et cetera, which we touched on some last time. But I think it's helpful to go all the way back to somebody like Machiavelli, and it's certainly everyone's familiar with The Prince, but most people are not familiar with another work that Machiavelli has called, called Art of War. Uh, I'm sure everyone's heard of Sun Tzu's Art of War. But Machiavelli takes a different approach and historians really rate this as kind of the first text of modern warfare. Now, granted, we're not interested in our day so much in uh, medieval, late medieval warfare, but what is interesting and what we should take note of are the tactics that Machiavelli discusses. Uh, and I should add as well that it's somewhat misleading when people discuss, you, or people talk about being Machiavellian. That's a little bit misleading because when you actually read Machiavelli, he's not 
uh, he he just he's not a person who advocates complete and total pragmatism. You know, he's not. There's a sense in which he advocates the ends justify the means, but it's not set in the from the context or the perspective that most people will take that quote to mean. I mean, in fact, he castigates uh, unruly, uh, immoral rulers at the end of the work that are given to vice. Uh, so it's not a, a completely, you know, hedonistic, uh, you know, criminal approach. Uh, he very much is a believer in the virtues. But what he is talking about is that when it comes to the war, uh, the spectrum of war, the theater of war, there are all kinds of tricks and tactics that are going to be used. And even if you choose not to use them, your opponents will. So we find all the way back in Art of War discussions of false flags. He doesn't use that term, but that's essentially what he's talking about. This is in book six of the Art of War. Uh, he talks about, you know, sending uh, spies into enemy camps. He talks about all kinds of dirty tricks that you can do. I won't go into them all, but there's 15 or 20 that he lists there. And he even lists possibility of utilizing religious ideas to demonize the opponent. Um, so again, not to take a side in this issue, but just merely looking at the objective fact of utilizing religious ideas propaganda as Machiavelli discusses, this all comes to play in uh, the Cold War. So I, I don't know if you want to get into World War II per se, but uh, particularly when you get to the Cold War, what you have from my research, and I even dug up uh, Paul Warburg's letters. He has letters where he writes to the Bolsheviks, talking about his uh, how he's he's you know happy that the that the Bolsheviks have been successful, and he hopes that the takedown of the Tsar and so forth is successful. Um, and so you can, if you know how to research and you can look up those archives, you can find out that a lot of this stuff is not conspiratorial; it's it's very real. So when we look at the works of Antony Sutton who was uh, worked at the Hoover Institute, uh, Sutton for a long time talked about the Western aid given to these different dictators, socialists, uh, communists, uh, and so forth, as well as fascists. So, for example, uh, Henry Ford has uh, a book, The International Jew, where he talks about the, the good of fascism and Nazism. And so we have uh, bankers like... Um, like I said, Warburg and others who were instrumental in supporting Bolshevism. So what happens is these all these revolutionary movements and, and fascism is no different. It's also very revolutionary in its ideology as well, uh, merely differing in terms of more so the uh, methodology of how to bring about the, uh, you know, the, the, the coming great era or the new man or whatever, um, you know, I won't go into all the differences of corporatism and all that. I'm sure uh, listeners are probably familiar with most of that. But to make a long story short, <clears throat> uh, the, the evidence is, is abundant that everything from, you know, the uh, Gorky Motor Park in um, the Soviet Union being being funded and set up by Ford. Ford went over to do that as well. Um, we find... Um, the train uh, train of gold that came in from uh, New York bankers to, to help the Bolsheviks take down the czar. And so when we look at the ideology of communism, especially if you've taken or studied much history of communism itself and Marxism, when you go back to Marx, Marx was funded by uh, a stock owner, Engels. Frederick Engels was actually a wealthy uh, uh, owner of, of stock. He was a trader at that time. And so he was the money behind Marx's uh, ability to just lay around all day in the library and think up these big, long treatises. So <clears throat> it's also helpful to understand that Marxism, from Marx's perspective, is not uh, directly opposed to capitalism. Now, it sees it as full of injustices. But what Marx says is that capitalism is a stage, an era within dialectical uh, materialism within history as it marches on towards the final product of the withering away of the state. So for Marx, Marx is very much a libertarian in terms of his eschatology or his, his end of times view in that he believed that the state would wither away. So what I'm getting, the reason I say all that is that even Marxism itself as an ideology 
is it's, is a banker creation. It's a it's a money power creation. So what we have in the history, I think, of Europe in the last two three hundred years, especially when you look at Freemasonry, which, as we said last time, was interested in uh, ending throne and altar. The history of Freemasonry is 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 central to much of this revolutionary fervor. So the the fire of the revolution, you know, the, the fire in the minds of men, as James Billington talked about, that that comes out of the French Revolution, that uh, takes a hold. Uh, Marx sort of takes up this mantle and this the same candle uh, of the revolution. This ideology is a technique. It's a technology. So in order to understand, you know, World War One, we have to look at things like that as well as World War II, and then into the Cold War, when the Nazis are defeated, fascism seems to not work out very well, ultimately. So the, the big, the new dialectic becomes the Soviet Union versus the United States. And there's a secret uh, Soviet-U.S. space program <laughs> this whole time, <laughs> which, is, <laughs> yeah, nice. which people should look into as well, I think, uh, which calls into question the, the dialectic here uh, in terms of what, what was portrayed as real and, and again i don't mean to oversimplify this because certainly there are there were real conflicts i mean in order to have the dialectic you have to have real real fights real battles real espionage that really goes on just like we look at uh, you know take the uh, baltimore ferguson situations if we look at it on the ground you know there are really people rioting you know um, and then on the on the other hand we've got this rumor which i think is itself a psyop the, the jade helm situation well that's the, that's the system's left hand in terms of you know soros funding this revolution and on the right hand you have this system uh, preparing for you know mass riots with these exercises which the exercises go on all the time so uh, i think the publicization of jade helm uh, itself is somewhat dubious and calls into question whether or not this is uh, something that was leaked intentionally uh, to see what the reaction amongst the so-called Patriot crowd would be. But that's a different subject. Back to the Cold War. So essentially, that's what's going on in my mind at that, like you said last time, metal level, at the level of the Bank for International Settlements, the level of people meeting at Davos, the level of people meeting at Bilderberg. Uh, they're, they're thinking in that, that, that vein. Uh, I have a, a really... I think poignant example of this when we look at say i don't mean to fast forward too far but uh, this was just one that pops into my head in the 90s when we had the situation with kosovo under the clinton era well of course that was not bill clinton's idea what happened with kosovo was that you had there was, it's very it was very important for drug running for drug lines and black market operations as we discussed before uh, Kosovo also has mines that are called the Tepka mines. And so what happened in the 90s was the special committee group of the, the Bilderbergers that is called the International Crisis Group that was set up by, uh, funded by Soros. And uh, we see all the same characters there. Brzezinski is part of this group. Uh, who else? G uh, General Wesley Clark is involved in this group. Well, the crisis group gets together and they write a paper uh, that talks about uh, what's it called? Uh, I was just reading it earlier. Tre no, Trepka, Trepka, excuse me, Trepka, making sense of the labyrinth. Okay, and you can find this online. And what it discusses is that the mines there <laughs> with these uh, rare earth minerals and so forth are an environmental hazard. And so what we need is uh, the Western elite corporations to come in and uh, save save Kosovo, save this region from environmental regulations and from the evil government that's keeping its population down. So what happened was under the cover of Doctors Without Borders, the founder of whom is also a Bilderberg member, uh, the founder of Doctors With Borders utilized that or uh, organization to send money and weapons to the KLA. And the KLA were the Kosovo Liberation Army. By the way, any pretty much anything that's named Liberation Army, Liberation Front, you can already just kind of X that out as phony. 
in my experience, that always turns out to be a completely uh, duped crowd of tools uh, for some other power. So that's what's going on here. You have this liberation army funded by the CIA, funded by the West, Bilderbergers, under the cover of humanitarian aid, NGOs, Doctors Without Borders, uh, that is supposed to take down the existing regime so that the people can be, quote, free and so that uh, the very lucrative mines in that region will no longer be an environmental hazard. <laughs> <laughs> Call me skeptical, but I don't believe that there's any concern over environmental hazards here. I think that this is very much uh, this was an example of, of the kind of thing that I'm talking about. So that so even though this is kind of uh, post Cold War, this is one little p puzzle piece I was reading about today that I think gives us uh, insight into the way this game is played. I mean, on the ground, you really have a Kosovo Liberation Army that's fighting the existing forces. Uh, you know, uh, General Wesley Clark, you know, formerly of NATO, uh, NATO's uh, Supreme Allied Commander. Uh, who, who now, you know, in the last 10 years has come out as this champion of being anti-war. Well, that's, I mean, come on, give me a break here. I mean, he was, yeah. <laughs> when you find out what he was doing in terms of NATO, uh, his, uh, you know, centrist democratic uh, perspective or, or persona that he puts on is, is kind of uh, kind of laughable. But but yeah, I mean, again, this the, the Bilderberg is a great example of something that that has existed throughout the Cold War, uh, and has had no qualms about making deals with uh, the so-called enemy. Uh, another great example of this, I have a, a an article uh, that deals with Western support for the Maoist guerrillas. So when the West decided that Chiang Kai-shek was uh, useless, that he was thrown under the bus and the CIA, this is on the CIA website, by the way, sent uh, Bill Donovan over, the founder of uh, sort of the father of the OSS, to train all the Maoist guerrillas, okay, to fight to fight Nazis. So the, the rise of international communism, you, you consistently find, always comes back to uh, Western elites, uh, the OSS, uh, you know, British intelligence involvement and so forth. Uh, and so the, the network of spies that Donovan set up throughout China that are supposed to be these, you know, horrendous communists, they're all set up by the OSS. <laughs> <laughs> and Mao was Yale educated, if I'm not. Exactly. Yeah. Mao was a Yali, a Yale in China. Skull and bones. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And that's not that's not by accident. Skull and bones is just the uh, American Eastern uh, establishment outpost of this same uh, uh, Anglo-American Atlantis establishment, you know, which again, uh, as I, I know you know, but you know, it doesn't have anything to do with the people of these different nations. It's the um, industrial uh, banking elites, uh, the Milner Group, uh, Oxford Roundtable Groups, and so forth. That Quigley calls the Anglophile Network. So I mean, that's his terminology, and he's, you know, he's writing his book, as I understand, for. CA uh, section chiefs in the 70s so that they could understand why are we funding communists? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know, why is the CIA aiding uh, communists in Albania and so forth? So, so that, that book is written to explain that for people who are, you know, working within the system. Uh, so, so that's, that's some idea, some idea, I think, of what is, is going on with the Cold War. We also have, um, in the 40s, the CFR had me, and this is on the CFR's archives too, on their site, uh, they're about three-fourths of the CFR in, in 44, 45, I believe, uh, wanted to merge with the Soviet Union. And so they had already projected the so-called third way that people like Alvin Toffler writes about, um, that that was the future, that was the way we, we needed to go, they wanted to go. And so uh, all, all attempts at reconciliation with the Soviet Union should be should be reached for. Uh, there was a minority that disagreed with that. Uh, I think one of the Dulleses, perhaps, uh, maybe even James Jesus Angleton uh, was amongst that that minority, if I recall. Uh, but uh, Alger Hiss was amongst the party that wanted to unite with the Soviet Union. So does this factor into his being outed as a communist? I would think so, yeah. uh, particularly from the uh, 
so-called right wing side of this with the, the Dulles Angleton yeah, it's Im- style. It's important what you're alluding to, at least what you're trying to say, is that within this group, it's, there are factions, and they're, they're, it's a human organization. So there's going to be differences, exactly. and fights, and squabbles, right. and there's going to be bloodletting and sacrificial lambs, things like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's what a lot of what we see, and then that really just adds the complexity to to the matter. I mean, you know, people talk about there being what five, six, seven different factions of the CIA even today. So, uh, you know, and then as we said last time, sometimes the CIA, CIA doesn't like the NSA and so yeah. forth. But, you know, it's more so at the meta meta level, as you called it, which is a good way to put it, where, where you're, you're really talking about the people who are, you know, meeting at Bilderberg, meeting at Davos, meeting at the BIS. And these are the, the movers and shakers that are, they're really seem to and the one way you know that is because they keep popping up. I mean, it <laughs> doesn't matter what you read. Like, you keep seeing these same types of people pop up as, you know, kind of lurking in the background as invisible hand specter type situations, bond type stuff. So it's almost like if so, you're a, 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 an honest uh, district attorney, let's imagine there, there are a few and they're investigating or, organized crime. Yeah. Uh, he would get these pictures of these various crime bosses and and, and have – intelligence on them or evidence that they were were meeting at certain places always popping up and from that he would develop a conspiracy theory right that's a great way to put it putting putting stuff in a local model is is usually a good pedagogical tool uh, because i mean everybody understands i think most everybody understands corruption at the local level and i mean everybody's seen you know local judges you know get caught with cocaine or hookers or, you know, the local police being busted in some scandal or something. Uh, and it's no different on the on the global scale. It's just that they're more prominent players. So, you know, sometimes the uh, local drug dealer or the local whorehouse or crack house might actually have a deal with the police. Uh, now, on the, on the streets, the police are arresting the thugs or the hookers uh, and the thugs might shoot a cop. And so it appears that the war is real, right? Uh, but there are backroom deals, I guess, is essentially what's... But, I mean, that just should just be so obvious and common sense. But, you know, again, when we think about the the Cold War, I think it's important to understand the technological buildup that would come out of it. You know, we think about the famous military-industrial complex speech of Eisenhower and all that. Well, what he's warning about is really... What comes, what what comes about? I mean, that's that's he spelled out what was going to happen, and that that was all done at, under the auspices of the Cold War. So, uh, I'm not meaning to support communism here, but what I'm saying is that the idea that we've got to have this uh, space race and we've got to have this uh, this you know arms buildup race to be able to withstand you know the mutually assured destruction and all this stuff. That's all Rand Corporation dreamed up stuff, I think, uh, especially if you read something like Alex Abea's book on the Rand Corporation. You see that they've, they've uh, masterminded and engineered us in that direction. You know, we look at somebody like Herman Kahn. That's Soldiers of Reason, right? His book. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Herman Kahn uh, was the kind of the daddy of the doomsday clock idea and all this that you know, the nuclear war is eventually going to happen. So, you know, Rand sitting around war gaming and thinking about, well, what happened if we did have a, a nuclear war? What, what are the, what's the algorithm that we could draw up to figure out if, you know, if uh, we, how many will survive and, you know, can we actually take out the Soviet Union and blah, 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 you know, and, and these are all, you know, former Trotskyites that become the, the neocons. That's who are the, 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 that's the brain trust, the defense intellectuals, as Gould and Fitzgerald call them, that make up Rand. So uh, you have this, again, still revolutionary ideology that's running these entities like Rand. And I think that helps to explain why when people look at neoconservative foreign policy or something like that, <clears throat> they have a hard time figuring out, I'm saying, you know, the average public, you know, have, they have a hard time figuring out, well, why is it that we're continually, decade after decade, being engineered in this more liberal, quote unquote, liberal, liberal world order perspective in the sense of, uh, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's Bush, uh, uh, Obama, 
it's not Bush and Obama and, uh, you know, whoever else is going to be. It's the think tanks, the foundations that are driving the, the policy and the ideology to take us in a perspective where we can integrate into the, quote, global community. So any forms of sovereignty have to be knocked out. And by the way, I might add, <clears throat> uh, in Tragedy and Hope, Quigley actually says that the idea for continental unions is not a recent plan. This is actually an old plan. <laughs> and uh, every different power block has used this. So not uh, the, the Nazis had the idea for continental union trading blocks and that the continental union trading block would be a stepping stone to the global government. So, well, Nazis didn't work out. Uh, but that same ideology, that same plan, which is more of a, you know, roundtable Oxford style plan, that is what's being implemented. Okay, so that's all this TPP, you know, partnership, all that, that goes back, you know, 100 years. So this is an old strategy, an old plan. And so looking at the Cold War, what that is, that is the, the uh, thesis, antith antithesis, synthesis, you know, Cold War, America, thesis, Soviet Union, antithesis, Third way blending, Alvin Toffler, etc. That's the synthesis uh, that takes us towards uh, global government. So, and then again, ultimately, that is kind of a revolutionary Marxist strategy of, you know, smashing things together and then you know, uh, war out of chaos, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so that that's what's going on. That is the 20th century. Um, we're, you know well on our way in into that and and I don't, I don't mean to ramble all day but it's important to i think understand that the the cold war allowed the the silicon valley elite the military tech warfare elite to utilize all of this money all of this black budget stuff all this black black ops stuff funnel billions of, of dollars, trillions over over decades throughout the Cold War into all these uh, high-tech research projects. And so that's why you have the, uh, you know, Bohemian Grove, I think in 83, 82, 83, proposing the, uh, the Star Wars Defense Initiative. Now, the internet has already existed since uh, the 60s, late 60s and into the 70s, um, DARPAnet and ARPANET. And by 1991 or two, it becomes just internet. But this is this is established by this same coterie uh, that is involved in Iran Contra. Okay, so John Poindexter for a, was involved in establishing DARPA. Uh, he was also convicted in in the Iran Contra scandal. So what, what I'm getting at here is that even even this of the of the of the octopus. Uh, is it's all the same types of players and so when we look at darpa when we look at the build-up of the star wars defense initiative which was which was darpa which was using darpa uh, that allowed the uh, emergence of what will what is the architecture of the coming tech surveillance grid and the internet of things i mean all of this is straight out of darpa so that's that's the whole, I think, ultimately, the point of the, of the Star Wars Defense Initiative was not ultimately because of, I mean, yeah, there's a strategic defense, you know, protection security aspect of it. But what you're going to see is that iPhones are, are in Russia. You know, iPhones are in uh, China. iPhones are made in China. <laughs> I, mean, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the uniformity of the monopolistic system that we're under is itself by its very nature i guess designed to to be global uh and so it's the techno it's the technological aspect of it that's going to carry us into um into the global government uh you know mainly through things like simplicity and ease i mean it's going to be easy to have a cashless society when you pay with your phone or with a microchip um, and then that's really what I think the Cold War and the long term strategy was about was was about ending national sovereignty, forcing nations into larger power blocks. You know, think of the Soviet satellite nations 
uh, think about the U.S. You know, and all their uh, CIA puppet dictators and everything, forcing a, a, a global conflict, and then out of this, you you coagulate. You know, kind of like the alchemical Soviet coagulate. You know, the alchemical um, mantra. So, so that's my perspective on the Cold War in brief. It's you have to take this broad look we, because in order to get where we are today, you needed the. the the conflicts of the 20th century, the Cold War and the subsequent war on terror. And it wasn't just uh, politicians responding to exigent circumstances or uh, various unrelated emergencies or just, just sort of a chain of events that were related but not really part of a plan. What you're, there is, what you're suggesting is there's some sort of long-term plan, um, broadly speaking. It doesn't say there aren't Aren't you, uh, you know, turns and right. you know, uh, things exactly. that occur within the within those conflicts? But broadly speaking, it's being directed in, in, in that direction, and Absolutely. we do have evidence for that. I, I think I mentioned last briefly, um, last conversation about the Reese Committee investigations of the 1950s. At the time, I think they thought they were investigating communists. As they dug deeper, exactly. it was much more than communism, and I think it was Norman Dodd who hired a young lady named Catherine Casey. Was her name? And she w was sent up to investigate the, uh, I think, the Carnegie Endowment for Peace. And she was very skeptical about the investigation, saying these foundations are all, they're philanthropic, they're good, and you know, she b basically had the mainstream view of these of these organizations. But in the course of their investigation, uh, I guess at the time the foundations themselves were gullible, not uh, they didn't take proper uh, care to keep her out of, out of the minutes, and she was able to go through the minutes of these meetings and. She had a nervous breakdown from what she found out, according to Norman Dodd. She couldn't handle it. Um, she found a broad, you know, this this conspiracy, if you want to use that word, of these foundations um, to uh, embroil the United States in a series of wars. And that's the only way you could transform the country and collectivize it. And collectivize is an important word because ultimately these people are collectivists, I guess. And, of course, they're the ones deciding, you know, deciding things. And that in itself, I think, gave us an idea of what what was good, what was going to come in the 20th century and it and it, it did I mean you had the world wars you had the cold war you had what the creation of the league of nations the bank of international settlements that system yeah. collapsed and out of world war ii we got the un the world bank the imf right <laughs> and we go from there so that's an interesting you know perspective you take that broad look you know so yeah it's this it's, it's, it's repeating patterns yeah. it's just like you know, aiding Saddam and then taking him out, putting in the next, yeah. you know, next guy. And then he has, like we said, an expiration date when he, he, he starts to go bad and stink like milk in the fridge. Uh, but, you know, this is exactly what uh, Toffler's book, The Third Wave, talks about. You know, he talks about first wave society being agrarian and so forth. And then you have an industrial revolution, the second wave. And then the, the so supposed third wave that we're, you know, destined to enter is the uh, super industrial society where you have uh, the space age, the technotronic era, global village, blah, 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 blah. And this is, you know, where we get into the whole green agenda and all that with uh, the Club of Rome and Marie Strong and these different, you know, this is a very, very crucial arm of the think tank foundation um, leg of the octopus, arm of the octopus, because they that's who created this whole green movement. So, you know, in that article that you mentioned that I did on ISIS and feminists and thugs, I mean, we could throw in another one, which is the greenies. The greenies are just another one of these supposed, uh, you know, enlightened minorities that think that they have it all figured out. And uh, because their professor with, you know, the homosexual professor with the, the <laughs> ponytail, with the ponytail and the t-shirt and the Marxist uh, lingo told them that that uh, everything Western is bad and that the only way out of all this is to accept austerity and living. Uh, I mean, I heard all this in college, so I mean, I saw it firsthand. I'm sure I'm sure we've all seen that. That, that came out of the Club of Rome, this sort of this. It did. Yeah. I mean, that's the, yeah. yeah and, and these but these are all the same. I mean, it, all of the for example, I dug up uh, Shell white papers from Shell uh, funding the green movement. <laughs> now, I mean, I'm sure that's not surprising to you, but but I think to most people caught up in these, you know, little bitty frag fragmented dialectics and these these little piecemeal approaches, they might think, well, why, why would why would Shell fund uh, the green movement? 
Well, the green movement is is central to moving towards what you're talking about, this this global community, global village, the third wave, because it ultimately means that there's no, that there's only the collective. Well, why would J.P. Morgan like you said, there's only the global yeah. village? Why would J.P. Morgan right. fund the Bolsheviks? Is that Anthony Sutton? Exactly. But Anthony Sutton. Exactly. Anthony, uh, you, as you mentioned, Anthony Sutton, just, I want to delve a little into his research. You said he, he uncovered that Wall Street had supported the Bolsheviks, the Nazis, the Italian fascists, even Sun Yat-sen in China, undermining yes. China. They were also uh, with uh, Yale and, uh, and Mao, Mao's revolution. Um, his view is that Funding these organizations, or funding these radical groups, revolutionary groups, these wars made business sense because what they wanted to do is they wanted to capture, create captured markets. They wanted to destabilize areas like Russia because they didn't want them to compete with the West. At the same time, they could destabilize the region and gain access to the resources and control the situation. Whereas Absolutely. if Russia were allowed to develop on its own, which it was up until 1914, um, it was becoming sort of a capitalist a constitutional monarchy. Then it was destabilized. But that that that's, right. that 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 goes back to British policy with Halford Mackinder with the control of Eurasia. Can you explain a little of that? Because there's a British angle here. There's a Zionist angle here. Like you said, there's a lot of factions involved in this. There are these different factions. You're yeah. right, and uh, you know you've got uh, you know Brzezinski representing kind of that. Uh, you know, one of the main minds of the Cold War. Uh, so I think he's central to understanding the. The Atlanticist, but not necessarily Zionist wing of of the spectrum, uh, where he he his strategy is uh, that because Afghanistan is the the, the gateway to Eurasia, <clears throat> the gateway to the East, and it's also again very much a heroin opium uh, hotbed. It's always there, isn't it? So, <laughs> exactly. The uh, yeah. Right, and and just like with uh, the KLA and you know fighting Slobodan Milosevic, uh, it's the same situation with Afghanistan, where you've got the uh, the Iran Contra crew, which so, which shows that the 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 ideologies may differ because Brzezinski might have a, a different ideology with uh, neoconservative war hawk type approaches, but regardless, uh, uh, it's the same crew with the BCCI that's funding the Mujahideen, uh, that's that's the, you know, the neocons that are funding the uh, Contras, right, with, through Iran-Contra. So it's it's the same bank utilizing the same uh, principles. It just might be different uh, game plans. You know, it's like you have, you have a coach and an assistant coach on the team, and the assistant coach might prefer this play, <laughs> but the head coach says, now we're going to go with this one. So I think that's kind of how it, plays out on the ground in terms of um, you know, policy making and strategies and so forth. But uh, but 1978-79 is a great example because, uh, <clears throat> you know, that's really um, that's really a culmination, I guess, of, of 100 year, 150 years of, of great game. And um, well, it wouldn't be 150, it would be late 1800s to to uh, 1978. But but that's that, that kind of a culmination there where where you know, the, the idea of funding and radicalizing uh, Islamic Jihad really is, Brzezinski steps into that role of, of uh, taking the mantle of what the British strategists had done for so long prior to him. So, you know, the, 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 I, when we understand that, then it, when we start thinking about the propaganda of things like, well, the, the evil empire and all that, that really doesn't have any meaning at this level. That's just that's just propaganda to you know mobilize, mobilize the masses for for uh, you know getting behind this or that war. So um, I don't know if that answers answers your question, but uh, you know there is some some speculation that I think is interesting. Uh, I don't know if you know who Kerry Bolton is. I don't agree with necessarily everything that Kerry Bolton says, but he does have an interesting thesis that that uh, Stalin didn't uh, completely go according to script. Uh, and so part of the reason, again, not totality, but part of the reason for the Cold War uh, was that uh, Stalin was was doing some things that um, the Atlanticists did not like. Uh, for example, the, the CFR meetings that I mentioned where uh, the, they were 
ready to offer billions uh, in aid to to the Soviet Union. Stalin uh, apparently did not accept that aid. So, uh, you know, as to all the exact details of, uh, you know, to what degree this or that Western industrialist or banker still had their fingers, uh, you know, involved in uh, building up the Soviet Union, that's still something I'm kind of trying to tease out because uh, you know, this is just Cold War stuff is really just something that I've taken on as, as a research project in the last, you know, four or five years. So I, I wouldn't by any means call myself an expert, but I definitely think that the basic principles that Sutton lays down about the, the funding of fascist, communists, and uh, socialists and Soviets is, is absolutely true. Uh, and then so from there, it's more so a matter of teasing out, you know, who's going off script, you know, who's making who mad, who's actually, you know, who's actually maybe trying to set up some kind of resistance. I, I think in the situation with Russia now, it's, it's interesting because, um, you know, uh, Putin did... Uh, kick out uh, certain uh, Russian mafia uh, guys. Uh, there, there has been some apparent uh, difference in terms of what's going on in Russia. So I think that that's interesting in terms of uh, where things are going, especially when we think about the, that the IMF was who, you know, looted Russia for, you know, hundreds of billions uh, under Yeltsin. So once uh, Gorbachev sort of supposedly caved in to the West, uh, in come the vultures to, you know, to loot, loot the place. And what ha that's exactly what happened with the Ukraine when you had the, the, the coup in Kiev, well, in comes the IMF. So here's $18 billion uh, sign on to everything we want. So that, that's, that, that's the whole thing right there. I mean, it's just like with uh, Milosevic and the KLA, what happens? Well, as soon as Milosevic goes down, in comes the it's IMF. It's the hitman model, I guess. That's exactly. Yeah, that's and they, yeah, and yeah. You're you mentioned Stalin. It's interesting. Uh, Stalin didn't exactly go to script, and that's how you have to look at these things because although we often use terms like moving the chess pieces, the pieces that are moved aren't pieces of wood. They are human beings, and they're mm -hmm. complex and dynamic. And and some people uh, have suggested or have, have theorized that that same thing happened with Hitler. That he went off script a little bit, and then they had to improvise, and that's why when you right. say these wars are engineered, it does not mean that everything is planned for. It just broadly speaking, they're planned, they're executed. They need a crisis, they need a general war. Just like some people also theorize that if you read the Zionist literature in the early 20th century, is in order to uh, vindicate the Zionist plan, they needed a general crisis in Europe to get the Jews out of Europe. And broadly speaking, the Zionists and the SS had the same objective to get the Jews out of Europe, <laughs> and they achieve that. Well, yeah. and, and and what was who was uh, involved in that? Lord Balfour. Lord Balfour, who uh, that in fact so, in the U.S. entry yeah. into the war, yeah, because they promised yeah. that with their influence, in the United States on Wall Street, with people like um, Brandeis and uh, I guess who was the, uh, the um, guy of the uh, the economic uh, czar at World War One. What was his name? Uh, economic. The, well, that's the term I'm using, but um, Baruch Bernard Baruch. Uh, not the, oh, yeah, the, the banker, banker okay. and he, uh, Jacob Schiff, and you know Kuhn Loeb and these right, guys, right. and so they might have had a personal Loeb's grudge against Russia itself uh, because of Russia's reputation. Yeah. So there's a lot of a uh, lot of could have been multiple motivations behind this thing. But um, uh, uh, well, know, here's a good example I always use, and I'm sorry to cut you off, but let's say you had a local business, and let's say you were bug man, and you sprayed for bugs. And in comes, uh, you know, let's say you have an employee who quits and he starts, you know, the best bug service dot com. Yeah. Right. So he's got his bet. He's got the best. So what do you do? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the judge and to the city commission. And I'm going to say that the chemical that he's using uh, is uh, an environmental uh, danger and that it's illegal. So I get that law passed puts him out of business. I mean, that that's really all, all this stuff is. And it, it doesn't have to be bug spray. I mean, it could be, uh, you know, opium. that's great. Yeah. It, that's great. <laughs> we we got to crack down on the, on the drug running in Kosovo. Yeah. And well, so then we come in to run the drug. Yeah. That's how, how we kicked the French out of Indochina. 
There you go. Right. <laughs> that was a big OSS operation, CIA, literally CIA. But that's, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was just in preparation for the interview. I happened to watch an interview with Anthony Sutton and the late uh, Stanley Monteith. And yes. he, he says, you have to look at it this way. These are businessmen. And the way you get really mm -hmm. rich is you don't go into the market and compete with everybody. You you monopolize and you cozy up to the government. You take over the government and you use governmental power to go in to uh, take over markets, to create, to capture markets. And that's what these guys are doing in Russia. You know, William Boyce Thompson or Thomas Lamont, uh, Jacob Schiff, uh, these guys that, that showered the Bolsheviks with millions of dollars. They were also funding the white Russians at the time too. For, you know, so they were hedging their bets. And so it isn't to say these guys were committed communists. And, you know, they were, <laughs> they were opportunists. Ruthlessly. So, yeah, that's exactly. What it was. The, at that level, it's, they don't care about yeah, ideology. No, no, <laughs> yeah. Ideology is for dummies down on the street protesting. And that's what Kara Quigley said in Hat Trash and Hope. Yeah. Exactly. It reminds me of uh, the funny scene in Back to School with Rodney Dangerfield where <laughs> he gets back to college with his son and there's this snooty, know it all, you know, sort of left leaning economics professor who's up there talking about all these facts and figures and uh, Rodney Dangerfield keeps interrupting and he says, oh, well, I don't understand. Who's going to grease the politicians? You haven't mentioned that yet in your lecture. <laughs> <laughs> That's so important because often when you deal with political science and politics and policy and you have these so-called ac the approved experts talking about this, they don't deal in the real world. I mean, they don't they, you know, that's they one don't of my main criticisms of, or, exactly, or they think it's of, of liber Yeah, the libertarian uh, treatment of economics, much of which I think, especially at the local level, is good and accurate. I think they have, and especially in terms of criticisms in general, they're they're good. Where I take issue with most libertarian economic thinkers is in terms of shadow markets and shadow banking. They never talk about that. Now, there might be some that do, but uh, for the most part, n that's never brought up. It's never mentioned. They don't talk about, you know, algorithmic trading scams. They don't talk about the power and importance of the black markets. Every now and then they will, if they're talking about, say, uh, legalization or decriminalization criminalization of drugs. But you never hear them discuss these kinds of things. And so uh, for the most part, I mean, uh, I, I don't hear that. Um, you're, you're never supposed to talk about, you know, black operations or false flags and stuff like that for probably 80 percent of, of the libertarian thinkers out there. In fact, I have what when I talked about uh, curious aspects of the Charlie Hebdo situation, I had one of the um, uh, quasi prominent libertarian called me out as a <laughs> he said I was a sock puppet fake profile. So he didn't even think I was real. Okay. <laughs> Uh, just because I said that, uh, you know, there were questionable aspects to Charlie Hebdo. But I don't mean to get yeah, off, yeah. Off, off talk. Yeah, they do. Have but, a, uh, I think you, yeah, you yeah, get yeah. my point, though, is, is that this is an overlooked arena of, of you know, especially shadow banking. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. It's just they're not dealing. They deal with theoretical and policy. And they I think it, uh, all, many of them just think it's belief they're beneath their dignity or they're afraid to be labeled. Uh, they're going to they're, they'll lose their their yeah, rather exactly. lowly but secure position in the totem pole. And so they don't want to bring out the exactly. ugly stuff and they want to be called a conspiracy theorist. And that's a big problem because it's, it's very real. But broadly speaking, I look at like when I'm looking at w world wars, World War One, World War Two, the Cold War and what we're dealing with today uh, in its aftermath, which is the so-called broad war on terror, whatever they want to call it. Um, it's incorporating Anthony Sutton's research who called the Cold – he pretty much called the Cold War a hoax. Um, it was more or less, this was a, sort of a financial and political coup. Wouldn't you call it that? Sort of a takeover process through a, a, through a centuries of sort of a, uh, I guess, an early version of the, sh of the shock doctrine. Sort of how, how do you achieve your objective? You just turn the world upside down and get a new order out of chaos. And they were able to pretty much secure their control, uh, pretty much of the world through these crises. And, that, and that's where we find ourselves today. Would that be a fair characterization of the current situation? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, the beginning of when it when there was the crisis in Egypt a few years ago, uh, you have Kissinger saying this is Act One of a play. Uh, so that that dis minor destabilization at that time, you know, we've we've just been seeing Act Two, Three, Four, Five since then. You know, Libya, et cetera, Ukraine. Uh, so it's all, and again, if somebody was was a skeptic, uh, you make a great point there. 
Tim, because if somebody was a skeptic, I would say, well, now, wait a minute. If, if what I'm saying is not true, then why is it the same pattern over and over? Why is it always the destabilization and then in comes the IMF? <laughs> why is that? Why, you know, you have the destabilization, the riots, you know, the economic collapse, tanks on the streets, you know, people crying, throwing rocks, whatever. Buildings burning and then in comes the IMF as the savior. Uh, and, and I think that it's just obvious, you know, it doesn't take a PhD in economics to figure out that this is this just a strategy that goes back. Like I said, Machiavelli talks about doing. They says send fake, fake soldiers into the enemy camp to stir up uh, dissent, to stir up division, uh, and watch them collapse from the inside. Sit up in your parapet and watch the enemies just fight each other. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's not any different on the global scale, uh, the difference is that we live in a situation of power blocks. Um, you know, Richard Haas of the uh, CFR says that we live in a multipolar world, uh, no longer in a bipolar world of uh, the Soviet Union. I don't, I don't really think that that's necessarily true. I think that I think that's CFR propaganda about how we've got to you know, we've got to do more to take over the world because there are all these threats out there, North Korea and China and Russia. Uh, most of that is theatrical um, because if you look at somebody like North Korea, I think much of that is staged. Much of the much of that news propaganda that comes out, they're fake. They're fake videos. They're fake pictures. I don't know what capabilities North Korea has, but uh, I know that the AP photos that they show me are not of a space program. <laughs> <laughs> They're uh, CIA AP photos that are laughable. So, you know, you know Kim Jong-un attended all the same, uh, the same uh, Swiss boarding school that uh, embassy CIA kids attend, as I wrote about three or four years ago. So I think, I think that is another indicator that uh, the, these threats are theatrical. And so when Richard Haas talks about the multipolar world of all these threats and all these crises, that's exactly what it is. You're absolutely right. It's just global. Uh, well, not, maybe not global. Now, I guess it probably is global because, uh, you know, the, the, the game plan of ISIS in uh, the Middle East, the game plan of uh, right sector fascists in uh, Kiev or Pussy Riot in Russia or, uh, you know, uh, Ferguson, uh, feminists, it's its all the same strategy of, of uh, rile up all these different groups and just basically create disintegration and chaos, uh, you know, to uh, to move things forward in the dialectical process. And you, uh, again, we've been talking about sort of geopolitics and the international application of these, of these methods. Uh, you mentioned Ferguson and Baltimore and how these, if a riot can't be faked it can be uh encouraged so let's just say and you can create the conditions because you you know what the conditions yes. are in these cities and it's very easy if you want to stir up a problem and there's there it's on record they're on record on doing that you had, you had operation chaos in the 60s and 70s the fbi we do know with core intel pro and groups like the similes Limber, liberation army yeah, well, they were oh, all out of Vacaville yeah. prison, and I think one of the guys was even a former like undercover cop and all that. And um, the same thing, you can even draw on the Manson case, and these cases have evidence of, of some sort of code on pro operation, some sort of psyops oper operation. You know, say, and the same with that. Yeah, you know, like I said, I mentioned, I interviewed uh, Dave McGowan recently, and the whole serial killer phenomenon might be a destabilization sort right. of a, a way to. Uh, atomize and uh, terrorize society, and the, he 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 makes the he, he was able to do the research and made the connections to military intelligence, which which defy normal explanation. That the, this too much of a coincidence to believe all those connections would exist if were these if these uh, characters were spontaneous or developed you know organically out of the uh, corrupt culture of, of the United States. And it, how, however chilling it is, however whacked out it may seem to the average person, the average person simply doesn't isn't familiar with the tactics of the psychological warfare weight uh, people you know yes um, so well, what, go and talk about yeah. that i think that's that's such a fascinating topic and you touched on that in your isis article about stirring things up how some of these events can be either faked or created you know or stirred up or you know go ahead so right. well i think about when i was a kid um 
you know, I remember seeing uh, the Iran Contra uh, hearings on the on TV on the news, and and then uh, I remember the most prominent things from the '80s, aside from Michael Jackson or Pepsi or <laughs> like that, would be <laughs> would be uh, would be Reagan on TV talking, and it would be things like Iran Contra, and it would be something like AIDS. I think AIDS is a great example because if you remember all the stuff that the TV news outlets just bombarded people with this was going to be just the end of the world i mean it was going to be does tens of hundreds of millions dead in the next 10 20 years and i mean it was just you know imminent ask imminent end of the world stuff uh and and then that didn't happen oh well <laughs> so if you watch there's a really interesting clip i should i should have put i should put it in an article or something but there's an interesting clip that somebody put together on youtube of all the news clips that they could find about AIDS from the early early 80s up until the early 90s, so about 10 years worth of AIDS clips. And you watch the progression of this. It, what you what you see is that it takes on the character of a PR campaign. Okay, now let's flip over to uh, towards the end of the 80s and into the 90s. A very similar campaign begins to ramp up with global warming. So when I was a kid in California, I remember seeing TV warnings about global warming and water and, you know, if you flush your toilet twice, then, you know, you're sinning and all this stuff. <clears throat> so you watch that campaign uh, and how it gets rebranded into climate change. Uh, and, and again, I'm not making a statement. Uh, I tend to think that uh, HIV is probably something other than what they say it is, but Nevertheless, the fear campaigns are, are the same uh, between AIDS and global warming. It's all the same style. The video, the 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 messages, the warnings that are given are the same. And yet, all of the the fantastical predictions that were given are completely inaccurate. There aren't uh, hundreds of millions of people that have AIDS. That is just complete nonsense. Uh, the oceans have not risen to completely encapsulate Florida and the West Coast. <laughs> England still so, exists. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I mean, you know, I, there was an, an article in The Independent that, that I think Alan Watt pointed out. It was about uh, 10 years old, 2003, four somewhere in there. It's really, really funny because the, the scientist, the, the, the expert, the scientist says that he is confident that by 2014 or 15 children will no longer know what snow is <laughs> snow is a thing of the past it's it's forgotten it's like dinosaur bones we will no longer kids won't even know what it is when you talk about snow uh again and so you, i mean it just it's retarded i don't know how else to put it uh i don't mean to be offensive but uh it really is a a, a well, and the news has put out at a you know fifth, fourth, fifth grade level now, so I don't guess that's surprising. But you know, to get back to the question of the serial killers, uh, you know that, as McGowan pointed out, very much a 60s, 70s, 80s phenomenon. Well, where'd they go? Yes, he pointed that. Yeah, <laughs> this is supposed to be. This is just like AIDS and you know global warming, uh, you know apocalypticism. Well, where are all the serial killers, right? So. Uh, and now I see, I, I do read every now and then psychological publications, and I find it amusing that when they talk about, they still do, they still talk about uh, every now and then all these serial killers that are out there. Uh, and I don't know what your views are on abortion, but it's funny to me that uh, it's always a middle-aged white male. They never talk about the possibility of uh, females that uh, abort their children being psychopathic, <laughs> but I get, you know, that's not see it's only white males that are psychopaths in there and you would think that they're still you know according to these psychological publications they're still you know everywhere out there right but as for the news presentation of the uh, ever-present serial killer out there we don't see that anymore right uh, and and as dave pointed out it, it absolutely transitioned to the mass shooter uh and i don't i have no doubt in my mind that that was um you know, a, a deep psyop decision to to take things into the next phase. So, you know, these things kind of go in phases. So, you know, I don't know what's next. Um, 
uh, the, the cyber stalker killer, yeah, I'm guessing, yeah. maybe next because we're see, we're seeing these movies where there was some weird movie out about uh, people, uh, a, a, a killer who uses Facebook or something. I forget the name. Un, unfriended. That's it. Yeah, the Facebook so, killer, which is uh, things, yeah. You have a TV killer, show now right. about so now we're, I think it's yeah. There you go, and that so that's the direction we're going to go in, and and cyber terror I think is going to be the, the big, big catch-all in the next uh, ten years because I think they they really are even though the internet is their baby and it's their uh, we- weaponized deployment, uh, it, like you said, there are still U-turns and changes and decisions that have to be made for all sorts of different scenarios. So. Uh, certainly, at some point, the internet will have to to come to an end, as it yeah, is presently. Uh, the psychological warfare angle uh, is very interesting to me. It's the most chilling because, well, it suggests that again that we're, we're being toyed with. And I guess if you're familiar with the Manhattan Project and what, what all the testing that occurred with that, and the the, the approach that the the corruption of the psychological, the psychiatric uh, associations in the 50s and 60s other M, under MK Ultra. And the various diseases, the Tuskegee the, the scandal, uh, you know, the idea that they were in Florida, they sent, they sprayed uh, a community with pathogens to see what the result would be. You had that, of course, that was at Ponce, the French town, where they blamed it argot poisoning, and, and it really was the, <laughs> yes. see, yeah, LSD and all that. So right. they're willing to do these things to play, you know, to, to screw with people's minds. That's, that's not, that, you know, that's not beyond them. So they do these things. Well, they- yeah. For a person, yeah, for a person who's skeptical of that, I would say all you have to do is look at uh, the testing that was done on troops in terms of radiation. So yeah. I, I have uh, one re- decently long article about the Manhattan Project and how, in my view, that was um, really ultimately uh, a, a broad-ranging series of projects and tests that were designed uh, to, uh, to move us towards a complete attack on the biosphere so that there could eventually be a synthetic rewrite of the biosphere. Uh, and admittedly, that's somewhat more uh, skeptical, but when we look at uh, where the transhumanists yeah. want to go and with the fact that the, the big geopolitical strategists are technocrats, they do believe you know, very firmly in the, the rise the of the technocratic age. Ultimately, I guess you could say. Yes, what it's, yeah. Ultimately, yes. And so the the Manhattan Project, I think, constitutes ultimately a complete, uh, a, a complete study and attack on the biosphere, and ultimately MK Ultra would factor into that because <clears throat> MK Ultra became MK Search, and MK Search was continued on even though after it was supposed to be shut down. All they did was just rename it, uh, rename it MK Search, and moved it to Fort Detrick. Well, Fort Detrick is where uh, in a bio warfare uh, work is done. And so what they did there was move into um, research in terms of electromagnetic stimulation, uh, implants, et cetera. So the idea of body modification uh, and where we're going with all of this uh, virtual reality, blah, 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 that has its origins in terms of psyops uh, back to MK, MK search at yes. Fort Detroit. Um Again, we're getting into an area that, that is more speculative, but also more fascinating and, and scary. Uh, but I do think there's, there's there's solid ground to uh, to pursue this because there's uh, get, get what we mentioned with with the MK Ultra and the Manhattan Project. They they have no problem with experimenting on people, and um, 